let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Tim Swindle. I'm the director of Lunar and Planetary Lab here. And I want to welcome you to the third and uh, last of our uh, public lectures for fall of 2016. Um, before we get started tonight, just uh, I hope you saw the things scrolling by, but a number of things coming up, uh, including the College of Science lecture series, which will be in uh, February, or centered around February, on uh, uh, you know, stretching our views of reality, various things from the cutting edge of modern physics. Um, the Art of Planetary Science show, which we'll have again this year. This year it'll be February 10th to the 12th, out here in the atrium. The whole atrium, three floors worth, will become an art gallery. Um, then there are a few, there are a couple of lectures left in the Stewart Observatory lecture series across the street. And um, I think that was about it that was on the uh, scroller. Uh, if we've got any students here for extra credit, um, we will be stamping things in the back after the lecture. Uh, tonight's lecture is by uh, Dr. Vishnu Reddy. He's a, a, a new assistant professor here. I um, have to tell you a little bit about his background. After his years in Bollywood, seriously, he, uh, went and to, he came to the U.S. and got um, advanced degrees up to through a Ph.D. at the University of North Dakota and then worked for a couple of years in Germany with the uh, science team for the Dawn spacecraft mission, then has been at the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson for three or four years, and then just joined LPL uh, this year. And so he's going to be talking this evening about a mission, a proposed mission called NEOCAM. Um, I believe the, the title is uh, Saving the Earth One Asteroid at a Time, or something like that. So Vishnu. Thank you, Tim. Can you guys hear me? All right, I'm going to be pacing back and forth, so just to keep you guys awake. I do that with my students. It always helps. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a mission concept. So this is not an active mission. Uh, it is a mission we've proposed. Uh, we have to compete for it. We've been competing it for 11 years, and they're going to, they're going to make a decision in six weeks. So you know, this is the only time I can talk about it because after six weeks, you know, we've got to start all over again, right? Uh, so just a brief outline what we'll be looking at today. I'll, I'll go over the basics of, uh, you know, solar system, you know, what we can see, what is out there, uh, you know, how to discover asteroids. We're going to jump into that a little bit. And there's a little activity. I have uh, Mary and Bert with several laser pointers. So as long as you don't point at me, you, you know, I'm fine. So we're going to play a little game. Uh, so why should we care about asteroids? We're going to look at that. And, uh, you know, what have we done about them? You know, what, is, what are they, you know, how have we protected ourselves and the Earth from asteroids over the last, you know, few decades? Uh, what is NEOCAM and what is it going to do for us in terms of asteroids? Okay. So if you guys go out in the night, you know, you, know, you can go out now or, you know, a bit earlier uh, in the night sky. If you look towards the west, southwest, uh, what you're going to see is a few bright things. Uh, most of you probably see a bright thing called Venus out there. That's, you know, that's the most obvious thing you can see. A uh, li little hard to see, you know, Saturn. And then there's also Mars, if you, if you extend that. That's the ecliptic, right? That's going, that's the orbital plane of our solar system. You know, that's what you see with the naked eye. But if you go and look things through a telescope, what would you see? You know, if you look at Mars, you know, with a really, really fancy telescope, or if you take images of it, it will look like that from an Earth-based telescope. Right, and then if you look at uh, you know Venus, it shows phases, because just like our moon, so you got different phases of the moon, and then you know Saturn, you know obviously is the most beautiful one, right? We have rings around Saturn. You look through a telescope, and then if you're like me, you don't sleep at all, or you wake up early, uh, you get to see Jupiter early in the morning. So it's gone behind the sun. It's come on the other side, it's the morning sky, and again Jupiter is a very beautiful thing to see in a telescope. You can actually see the bands and, you know, what, you, what people call as the red spot is actually pale orange um, uh, spot. But then there are, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of objects, uh, which we call as small bodies, that you cannot see with the eye, but they're out there. And some of these come close to the Earth, but most of them are out in the solar system. So how many are there, right? So this is the view of the solar system. You can see the sun here, uh, the orbits of the inner planets, 
and then you see a swarm of dots moving around. Uh, those dots are our asteroid belt. Okay, they're mostly between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Uh, we've discovered about you know 717,000 of them. That's the number of, you know a couple of hours ago when I made the PowerPoint. And then out of which about 15,000 are called near Earth objects. Okay, what are these things? Okay, they they are asteroids that don't stay between Mars and Jupiter, but come close to the Earth. They make close flyby of the Earth. And that's what you see in the newspaper, and that's what our guys at uh, Catalina Sky Survey and Space Watch track. These are called near-Earth objects. And so let's try and zoom in closer to see. Okay, so here are near-Earth objects. This is just a zoom in of that, this you know, red dots. It's hard to see. So near-Earth objects include near-Earth asteroids and near-Earth comets. You know, 99% of them are asteroids. You know, there's only one person that are near-Earth comets. You know, out of which about 1,700 of them are potentially hazardous. They're either too big and come too close or come too close to the Earth. You know, so that's what we kind of try and keep track of, you know, 1,700 objects or so that are hazardous. You know. so, but if you go out and look for an asteroid, you know, they're just points of light. You know, unless the asteroid holds a sign saying, I'm an asteroid. Right? <laughs> You're not going to find it. So how do you find asteroids? Right? That's the hard part that you know, people are doing surveys you know, try to face, like how do you figure it out? It's uh, pretty simple actually. So imagine, you know, you guys are all stars in the sky and one of you is an asteroid, who wants to be, let Tim be the asteroid, okay? We're gonna volunteer Tim for the asteroid position. So what you do is that, you know, so obviously, okay, so we use tools, right? You know, we're gonna use uh, telescopes to find asteroid Tim, right? So what are we gonna do? So we have Catalina Sky Survey, which is on uh, Mount Lemmon. And then you also have uh, Space Watch, which is on Kid Peak, right? So the way we're going to find asteroid Tim is that we take, you know, imagine I, I'm the telescope, I'm taking a picture of this room, and Tim, the asteroid, you know, is going to just look like any other person here, right? So I'm going to take a picture of him, Tim is going to be there. But since he's an asteroid, he's in a solar system, right? So he's going to move over time. So if I wait five minutes, Tim is going to move in his orbit around the sun. Thank you, Tim, I appreciate that. <laughs> I didn't mean to put you in that spot. But you know, so he would move, and then, you know, that's okay, I think, yeah. But, <laughs> so you, you take another image after five minutes, and then you take another one, and say you say like a set of four images. And then you, you try and, you know, because you guys are stars, you're in the background, you're far away from me, from the Earth, so you're gonna be fixed. When I align everything with you background stars, what's gonna happen is that we're gonna have Tim move. So this is, you see this object moving, so the stars are all still, but you see this little dot moving across the sky. And that's what, is, what that is, is that that's the position of the asteroid around the sun in that short time. Now, how do you find its orbit, right? That's the next tricky part. So just like on the Earth, right? So if you want to get home, okay, imagine you're new to Tucson, or you want to go somewhere. You know, you punch in the GPS, or you know, if you're really smart, you look at the map, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so then you look at the map, you can figure out, you know landmarks, right? You know, you know, so you know where to go, where to turn stuff. And you know, modern day and age, people use cell phones and find GPS coordinates and they navigate over there. So just like how on the Earth we have latitude and longitude, we have the same thing in the sky. It makes it easy to navigate and point at things. So these are called right ascension and declination. So right ascension is longitude, declination is latitude. Since I know the position of the stars, pretty accurately because you guys are so far away, you're not moving. In 20 minutes, I'm taking a picture of Tim jumping around so as he goes around the sun. Uh, I'm gonna use your positions to calculate his orbit, you know, his position. I can triangulate and find where he is. And this technique is what we call as astrometry. And that's the basic principle behind every discovery that's being made today. You know, it's such a fundamental and a very powerful technique. Uh, so, you know, just to give you an idea, you know, what astronomers do in that one. I didn't find out. So we're going to play a little game now. Okay. So any ideas what this asteroid is? You know, we just took, it's not asteroid Tim. Any idea? Okay. Yeah. You're going to, not yet, but I'll, I'll, okay. This is the largest asteroid. This is asteroid Vesta. Okay. It's 500 kilometers across. Okay. It's, it's again, it's going between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So yeah, from the earth, it's mostly a dot. And this picture was actually taken by the Dawn spacecraft when it actually 
went to see Vesta and orbited for about 16 months uh, a few years ago. Okay, next one. Okay, you guys have to try a little harder. Okay. We're going to play a game. Okay, you guys have to find the asteroid. There's two still pictures. Uh, Bert has a whole bunch of laser pointers, right? Uh, Mary has some too. Oh. <laughs> so if anybody wants to find where the asteroid is in the still picture, I'm going to pass laser pointers around. So this, you can raise your hand and you get a laser. Oh, he's pointing at something, so maybe give him. And there's more laser pointers if you want. As long as you don't point at me, I'm fine. Okay, and maybe here, that one. Okay, that's one. Okay, anybody else? That's it. Oh, there. Oh no, he's here. Maybe in the front. <laughs> there's many more. Actually, it gets worse. Oh yeah. No, no. no like there's more options. There's more images. Okay, try that one. See if it works. That one. Okay. Ooh. Okay, so all right, let's see who's who's who got it right. Okay, the big one, the most obvious one. <laughs> okay, any idea which what which is this one? Yeah. Okay, Tim. I mean Jim. Oh, come on. Yeah, it is Ceres. Yeah. So Ceres is the largest object in the asteroid belt. Okay. This one is about a thousand kilometers across. It's almost twice as big as Vesta. It's called. It's classified now as a dwarf planet, just like Pluto. Okay, so this is an, again another image, uh, a movie taken with, uh, made with Dawn images, the Dawn spacecraft after it visited Vesta, it left Vesta, went to Ceres and it's right now orbiting Ceres. It's just going to remain there and you know, it's going to die in a few years around its orbit around uh, Ceres. All right, next ones. Okay. Ooh. Lots of dots. Oh, nice. Yeah, I bought like several lasers. My, my, yeah, there you go. All right, that one. Okay, we got one candidate. Okay. Oh, there. Yeah, I'm going to blink next. All right. There's like several people from Space Watch here, and Catalina. <laughs> oh, that one. Which one? Okay, but show it again. I didn't see it. Right <laughs> okay, that one. Okay. All right. Both of them, I think, are wrong. I kind of know where it is. It's up there. No idea which one is this. Okay, Ooh. it may make it worse. That one. Okay, Ron has something. No, here. Oh, he, Ron, you want one? Here, Bert, Ron wants one. No, you guys have in the survey. Come on, you should know why this by heart now. Yeah, exactly. How many years have you been doing this? See, see, so you you get you guys are the GPS guys, not the map guys. <laughs> All right. Okay. Is it working? All right. Okay. There it is. This that one. All right. Okay. Can anybody find the comet? Found it? Yeah, some things are pretty obvious. So you can see the comet. And you know, some things become even more obvious. You don't even need to, a second image, but you know. No, that's a, that's a comet. I think, I don't know which one is this. I think maybe it's an ISON. Yeah, those are all stars. <laughs> okay, what about this one? No, what is it? I know, I blinked it. <laughs> Any idea what is this? No, close. No, he got he got close. Okay, it's Pluto. So, all right. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so why should we care about asteroids? So we we know we played a little game. We know how to find them now. Why should we care? So if you look at the historical record, there's several events that have taken place that suggest that asteroids play a critical role in shaping the course of life on Earth. You know, the most famous one is about 65 million years ago when we had about a 10 kilometer impactor uh, hit the Yucatan Peninsula just off, you know, 
off the coast here, uh, creating a big crater and actually causing the extinction of the dinosaurs. We think this is one of the most probable hypotheses that's out there. Uh, a little closer to home, uh, how many of you have been to Meteor Crater? Oh, good, a lot of people. So this event happened about 50,000 years ago. We had a, a you know, 50 meter iron, a nickel iron um, asteroid that impacted. Uh, and you know, if you if you go if you get even closer, I mean, people will say like, oh, this is 50,000 years ago. But you know, 100 years ago, we had the Tunguska event uh, in Siberia, uh, where you know something about 200 meters across. This was an air burst. You know, this was not really a physical impact, but something that exploded a little bit higher in the atmosphere. So the shock wave basically you know flattened a lot of land. Uh, uh, and then what you see here are the trees that have been flattened by this you know blast wave. Uh, and you know, a few you know, 20 years ago, the Shoemaker Levy Nine. A lot of people might remember, you know, uh, when you know, comet broke up into 21 fragments and impacted Jupiter over the course of a couple of weeks. Um, uh, and the, what you see here are the pieces of comets in the bottom, and then the impact scars due to this. And I think uh, one of the uh, fireballs from this was larger than the size of the Earth. You know, what you call as you know, sterilization event. You know, if something like that hits the Earth. It would cause a lot of damage, and and much more recently we had the Chelyabinsk event a few years ago over Russia. Uh, so here's the incoming uh, fireball. You can see it you know, mostly from dash cam videos. Um, and the interesting part is that uh, I have a piece of it here, so I would. Have like you guys to come down and take a look. And the other thing is also, I have a piece to give away as part of the raffle. So hang on to your raffle tickets, suddenly. So here's the blast wave itself. It's going to get loud, so watch your ears. So there's the shock wave that's going to come So people out watching, you know, obviously this is a shock wave. So these are the folks outside when they saw the trail. Pretty scary. Yeah. So I mean, I think about 700 people got cuts from glass. So, you can see. I'll play a little bit. This, you know, this was for a couple of minutes. Yeah, this is going to be bad. Bad day at the office. <laughs> yeah. Again, like I said, 8.45 in the morning, you know. Really bad day at the work. You know, store, yeah, so the doors got blown off. And there was one more. I think the smartest people were the kids. This is cool. you know, okay. This is going to be bad. So, yeah. Oh, run away. Yeah, this is a cool one. I see. Yeah, they don't. They don't blink. There's the, you know, just the shadow itself of the fireball going now. Okay. So, um, you know, after Shoemaker Levy 9, you know, Congress actually woke up. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. Yeah. So, Congress actually authorized NASA to discover and catalog NEOs, near Earth objects, 90% of them that are larger than one kilometer. So, we'll talk about why it's larger than one kilometer. And several surveys were funded, you know, Space Watch, uh, Catalina Sky Survey. And this mission was mostly accomplished by uh, the year, you know, 2005, 2006. And here's an example. This is a telescope, linear telescope. It's run by the, you know, the Air Force and the Lincoln Labs. And, you know, they were one of, part of one of the surveys. And the reason why we came to one kilometer is primarily in this plot. So on the bottom you have kilometer, the size of the object that's going to hit us. And the top, this you know, impact devastation. You can see how much damage it can cause, you know, in simple terms. 
So if you have really big objects, so for example, the KT impactor that killed the dinosaurs, the, the one that hit off the coast of Mexico, 10 kilometers across, that's a global you know, catastrophic event. That's going to cause a lot of damage. And then on the other side, if you look at the Tunguska event, that was like a 200 meter object, less than 200 meter object. You know, it, 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 its power is, it could, if, if it had happened over a city like Chelyabinsk, it would have destroyed it or caused extensive damage. And then, of course, Chelyabinsk itself, it's not really, you know, it sent a lot of people to the hospital, but it really didn't cause extensive damage because the incoming object was only about 20 meters across. It's not very big. Uh, so the one, one kilometer basically falls in the, in the range where you can take out a continent, you know, where, you know, if there is a particular civilization, that could be wiped out. So they thought, like, let's start with something reasonable, what we can achieve in a, fix, in a time frame that we think we can afford at that point. And so that's why the one kilometer was uh, taken. Uh, so reaching the goal, you can start seeing in this plot, here's time and the number of discoveries basically. And you can start seeing the red stuff is all the asteroids that are larger than one kilometer. And at about 2005, it starts to plateau. Basically what's happening at that point is you see you're, you're finding the asteroid you already found again. So basically that says that you know, we're starting to see the things we've already discovered. So we're hitting that 90% point. You know, so that's what we see. We'll talk about the other ones next. So what's the next goal? After this one kilometer uh, was reached, the next goal Congress said was, you know, we, we, let's go down to a smaller size, 140 meters, and try and find these within 15 years, you know, at that point. And so they, they put in a lot of money to this, towards this problem. And uh, so the, the budget went, you know, over the course of about a little over a decade, from 2 million to 4 million to 20 to 40, to 50 million, you know, it's not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things I'm at Grauman Center, but it's a lot of money compared to what we got before. And so the 140 meters, you know, here's a picture of Catalina Sky Survey that's, you know, again on Mount Lemmon, it's the most active telescope that is doing asteroid discovery work today. So if you look at this plot again, 180, 140 meters is roughly in the regional devastation range. So, you know, we're, we're trying to get closer and closer to, you know, smaller sizes so we can protect more and more things on the Earth. So how many are there? How many 140 meter objects are larger are there? So there are roughly about 25,000 of them. And it turns out that, you know, uh, we found about 7,400 of them so far, roughly, okay? And we find about 500 of them every, uh, every year or so. So, but at this rate, remember con original congressional goal was to find all these within 15 years of 2005, which is going to be 2020. We're, we're not going to make that goal simply because at, at the present rate, it will take about 35 years, more than 35 years, to actually accomplish this goal. And so what's the, what's the way we can enhance this? There are several ways of doing, you know, reaching this goal sooner than the next 35 years. Obviously, LSST is a large telescope that is being built. You know, it, it, the mirrors were cast here, operator, you know, at NOAO, but, you know, at UA, And then we also have existing surveys that are ramping up and trying to find these objects. One way we can address this issue is to look at space-based telescopes, not on the Earth, but in space, using you know, infrared light instead of reflected light uh, to find these objects. So NeoCam, uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a cartoon of it. It's not built yet, so you can see it. We'll go more into detail of what NeoCam, inside of NeoCam is. So it has two cameras, so we call it dual, uh, you know, dual channel. And it's, it's, it's essentially a 20-inch telescope. You know, you basically, you can hug the primary. It's about that size. You know, in this case, it's an off-axis telescope. So you can simultaneously put light into, you know, uh, you won't have any obstruction. So usually, when you have built a telescope, you have to you know, channel the light in such a way that it's not going to, you know, if you put a camera in front, then it'll obstruct the light coming into the telescope. In this case, you bend the mirrors in such a way that there's no obstruction. So that's why it's unobstructed. And it operates in a wavelength range that is far in the infrared, the things we don't see, actually. It's basically trying to see the heat reflect, I mean, given out by objects. That's what it's trying to do. And the interesting thing about it is that anytime you get into the infrared, you have to worry about, you know, the spacecraft itself generating heat, right? So that will cause a lot of noise. You know, if you're trying to look for something cold, you know, warm, and then your, your, your stuff is also warm at the same temperature, then you cannot. But it turns out when, once you launch into space, the telescope and the cameras, everything can cool just because they're in space down to about almost negative 400 Fahrenheit. 
you know, passive cooling. So this is a big technology development we have done. So like I said, it's it's going to this orbit around. It's called the Earth Sun L1 point. Uh, so I'll show you an image what it is. Uh, so you know, so NeoCam is basically uh, you know what you could NASA calls as a low cost mission. It's only 500 million. Okay, I know it's a lot of money. Okay, but there are different classes. So for example, medium class missions, Osiris Rex is what we call as you know a New Frontiers class. You know, they cap it on 800 million, and then. Flagship missions are like more than a billion, you know. So things like you know the rover, uh, the, the the big rover, Curiosity rover, Cassini mission, all these are big flagship missions. So these missions, which are called Discovery class missions, the half a billion dollar missions, are competed. So every time there's a call for it, uh, anybody who's a scientist, so you know faculty here, uh, scientists at other institutions can write a proposal, and go into this competition where people will review and select which mission idea is good. So in this round, the current round, there were 28 of them you know, uh, proposing. And out of which they selected five uh, to pay them you know, $3 million for one year to do more studies and write a better proposal. So that's, and then after we wrote the proposal, they reviewed it. And that's what is the down select now, from five to one, so you can actually make it to flight. And so we tried twice before. Okay, each time you got closer and closer, but not this close. Okay, so that's people spend a lot of energy to, you know, to, to make this thing work. So it's not really a, a handout. It's, you know, you take, you know, you have one in 28 chance of actually proposing and then one in five. And then, you know, hopefully once you get the thing, it will launch and go into space and actually work, you know, so. So here's, you know, some more details on the, on the spacecraft itself. It's a very simple setup. It, it actually uh, takes technologies from several missions we've already launched. Uh, the hole for the telescope itself is here. You have to have, you know, a thermal shade because we're looking in the infrared. We don't want to get hot. And so the, the thermal shade actually protects the spacecraft from getting too hot and actually having the uh, detectors, you know, at, at the right temperature because we're not cooling them, right, remember? So uh, here's the spacecraft bus. Again, more thermal shields to keep the heat away. It's also a radiator. The telescope itself is in this you know, box with a hole on top. And that's where it points at the sun. This part points towards the Earth. So like I said, it, it, it takes uh, technologies from several missions we've already worked on. Uh, for example, the WISE mission, uh, you heard of uh, before. It's, it also orbits the Earth in this case. The Kepler mission, which is famous for finding exoplanets, you might have heard about it, and also the Spitzer mission. It's, we, you know, all the, uh, these two are basically in the infrared. I think Kepler is a visible photometer, essentially. So we take heritage from all these instruments, and then that's what we're combining in our experience to fly the spacecraft. So what will it do? So to give you an example, so right now we've found about 15,000 Earth objects. So that is it, this blue bar. Uh, we have uh, basically characterized about 2,000 of these objects. What do you mean by characterized? So, you know, I can find Tim as an asteroid, but if I want to know more about him, I need to characterize him, right? I need to know, you know, what kind of dress he's wearing. Well, how do I figure that out? So I have to look at, you know, so there are different techniques beyond the detection of it. So if an asteroid is, you know, how fast it's rotating, you know, so that is characterization. What is it made of? That's characterization. So right now, we have characterized only 2,000 of the 15,000 we've found. NeoCam will discover about 300,000 of them in the five years it will operate, and also characterize at the same time. Uh, in the main asteroid belt, okay, these are MBAs. So remember, these main asteroid belts are between Mars and Jupiter, right? These are the 700,000 we've found so far. Over there, we will find about 8 million of them, so down to really, really small sizes. You know, we'll talk, you know, so you'll ask, like, why should we care about things that are far away? They're not going to threaten us. You know, these main belt asteroids, not only are they of scientific value because they tell about where these near-Earth objects are coming from. Remember, these near-Earth asteroids are coming. They get knocked off their orbits, and they come into, you know, close Earth space. They tell, not only they tell where they come from, but you also, you know, can look at it as, like, bycatch. You know, you go and try and find things in the ocean. You want certain fish, say tuna, but you catch other things, right? You can, you can use it for something, maybe make cat food, I don't know, you know. But in the same way, we can do additional science with this bycatch of 8 million asteroids and really start answering some fundamental questions not related to the hazard that they pose to the Earth, 
but about the solar system itself, how it formed, what were the conditions and things like that. And same thing, we will also find comets. So, so far, you know, we've discovered about 2,000 comets. We will essentially double that number of comets so to about, you know, 5,000. So why is NeoCam special? We talked about infrared, right? So this is the only plot I have in this thing. So I'll walk you through and we will work it out. So, uh, so what you have on the x-axis is wavelength, right? Okay, so this is basically what uh, humans can see is in this range uh, under the one number. So we basically see it till about 0.7 from 0.4. That's what is everything we see is in the tiny sliver that goes between the first bar and this bar. So that's it. That's all we see. Okay. On the y-axis, what you have is the amount of flux, so basically how bright it can be. Think of it that way. Okay. So for example, uh, in the visible, right, this is the light we see with our eye. Um, uh, the dark line is dark asteroids, things that are really black. So what I have here is uh, meteorites that are samples of asteroids that go from really dark to really bright. So when the talk is done, you can come and actually see what, you, what I mean by dark objects. So you can see here I have a meteorite. This is from an asteroid that only reflects 6% of its light. It's really dark. You know. At the same time, here's a uh, sample of a meteorite. This is uh, from Vesta. Remember that first target Dawn went to? This is a piece of that. So this reflects about 30% of the light. And I think, you know, I don't need to convince you, you can clearly tell the difference, right? So in the visible, you can see that one is dark, the other is bright. And that's essentially what you're seeing in this plot here. So the dark one is the 6% one, the dark asteroid. And the bright one is the 30% one, so things like Vesta, okay? But if you go, so what happens is that if you use a telescope that is looking in this, in this visible range, you're going to find what? You're going to find the bright ones more often than the dark ones, right? You will not be able to find uh, the dark ones simply because they don't reflect as much light. You'll be able to find smaller bright ones, and you will not be able to find larger dark ones, you know? So that's what is going to happen. So you, you have a limitations of what you can see in this uh, when you do a visible survey. They do a very good job, but when you come to the infrared, so these two boxes indicate the two cameras that are on NeoCam. You can see that uh, the telescope does not distinguish between dark and bright objects in the infrared. You know, they're all equally bright. And you can see the amount of light it, they, they put out in these wavelength ranges is much higher than in the visible part which we are used to seeing. So um, looking for asteroids in the infrared is actually very good because that's where most of their light is put out. And you will ask, what is this, this little black line? Those are stars and galaxies. Okay, they are mostly bright in the visible and dark in the infrared. So they actually don't dominate like they would do in our case. So cadence, so NeoCam, you know, is also optimized for discovery. So we do our own follow-up. So imagine you, you, you find an uh, asteroid, okay. How do you know that a year from now where it's going to be? You have to make repeated observations over time. And that's where, you know, uh, the two, two surveys we have here, the Catalina survey discovers things and Space Watch does follow up. In other words, it goes and makes sure that these asteroids that Catalina discovers doesn't get lost. In the case of NeoCam, it's hard because we're in space. We see parts of the sky that the ground-based telescopes cannot see. So we do our own follow up. So it's two, two things in the same one. And that's essentially what is shown here. So we talked about the uh, L1 Lagrange point. So why is that important? So in this plot, what I show is that here's the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth. So most of our telescopes are here, and they point uh, at a location. So it's primarily at the opposition region. In the case of uh, NeoCam, what it does is it looks at a region that most ground-based telescopes cannot see, really close to the Sun. And you get certain objects in there that are not easily visible from telescopes on the Earth. So that, that's what makes it, you know, we, we find things that some of the ground-based telescopes cannot find in, as part of their regular survey pattern. So here's, uh, we talked about the Lagrange uh, point, Earth-Sun one. So here is the Sun, here's the Earth. It's basically a gravitationally stable point in, in the Earth-Sun system that you can actually put a spacecraft and do th interesting science. So NeoCam is also complementary uh, to existing and future surveys. For example, Catalina and also the LSST we talked about. 
uh, here you can see that the red line is basically the, the, the predicted discovery rate, how many asteroids we will find if we go with status quo, with existing surveys, the way things are. If you bring in LSST, which is this 8 meter class survey telescope, uh, that, that, that discovery rate would increase, but then again, we're not going to hit the 90% congressional goal, which is this dotted line, you know, beyond 2035, you know, it'll take a while. But if you augment LSST uh, with NeoCam, uh, you, you know, you, you get much closer to making that discovery in around the 2030 time frame. And that's essentially what we're looking at, you know, if you launch in 2025, uh, you know, it's within five years we can actually find most of the objects. So just to summarize what we've, uh, you know, what we talked about today, you know, NASA will make the decision to select one of the five discovery proposals, uh, you know, next month. So we hope we're selected, you know, and the launch is actually set for uh, 2021 July uh, for a five-year mission. Uh, you know, our launch window, you know, you have heard about rockets, you know, that they have to meet a certain launch window, otherwise they have to wait for a day or a month, you know. In our case, we can launch 340 days a year, okay, simply because we're not going too far from the Earth, right? We're only going about 1.5 million kilometers away, you know, we're not going too far out. The other time we can launch, but we'll run into the moon, because that's what's there, so that's not a good thing. So we will try not to launch at that time. So anyway, I just want to thank, you know, people, you guys, thank you for paying taxes, you know, that's what pay, pays my work, the discovery program, uh, JPL, uh, you know, University of Arizona, and then, you know, our industry partners. We, we work with uh, several industry partners around the U.S. to put this proposal and patiently wait for 11 years, you know, keep working on it. So, but I'm happy to take any questions. So. All right. Uh, how much input do these individual private corporations have with regards to the political decision to go forward and actually do it, if they have any at all? Oh, how much influence they have yes. in the decision? Uh, uh, probably not a whole lot, because the amount of money they would each of them get is too little for them to make a big political donation to force it. Yeah. So they, they are, in other words, there are bigger, easier things they could go for. 500 million is not much in the grand scheme of things. You said it was slated for a five-year mission. What right. happens after five years? Uh, we can continue operating. So one of the, th that's a very good question, because in the case of the WISE mission, we ran out of, you know, the coolant, the cryogen ran out, and same thing with Spitzer. That's one of the things we don't want to have, and we've, you know, NASA gave some technology development to actually run these detectors, passive cooled, so we could technically run it Till something happens to the reaction wheels or something like that, so we can't. So we can go on, you know, as long as the spacecraft is healthy. Yeah, p people, you know, the bio, yeah, that's how this case. Yes. I have a sort of related question. Sure. Are there other applications for studying uh, other types of solar system objects or doing other astrophysics after the five sure. years? Yeah. No, absolutely. So you know, that's the other great thing about Neo, uh, NeoCam is that we catch all the galaxies and stars and everything that we can see as a background bycatch. So it, it, it's, it's interesting because the project originated in the WISE mission. Uh, WISE was originally an astrophysics mission looking for cool, cooler stuff, cooler stars and things like that. And we used the bycatch of WISE, which were asteroids, and created a program called NeoWISE. And that's where the team came out about. And then we realized, you know, NeoWISE is great, but what happens if you purposefully built a telescope that is meant for asteroids. I mean, we always get hand downs, you know. Asteroid people know it very well. Very few of our telescopes are actually purposefully built for that, you know, reason. And so that's one reason why we came up with NeoCams, where, you know, we, it's optimized for doing asteroid work. And so we can return the favor to the astrophysicists now by giving the things we don't like, which, you know, in the background, so. Hey, so earlier in the presentation, you mentioned how um, the magic number for deadly asteroids is one kilometer. Um, why is that, and what is the primary composition of those bigger ones? Sure, like? uh, that's a good question. So one kilometer is basically, you know, we looked at the plot. It, is, it was, you know, things that are hitting, you know, which can destroy a continent, you know. So that was just like, a, you know, a good number to pick at that point. It was, you know, it was right in the middle of the size range that we think. And it again depends upon uh, not only 
the size but also at what velocity it is coming you know and where it is going to hit and depending on what damage it is going to cause. The composition um, it is basically you can pick and choose it is it is everything majority of them have composition very similar to Chelyabinsk you know they, they are S type objects and then the, the next dominant one is you know the 6 percent albedo ones the dark ones I showed that is that is the kind so they are about you can say if you ignore the small ones you can say they are about half and half roughly you know dark and bright ones. Question. There was an interesting telescope called Dragonfly I think that used a reflector or refractor instead of reflector with special coatings on the lenses so it did not have the scatter from the reflector. Okay. Would this be applicable to something like this looking for dim objects? I kind of I think I remember seeing the paper somewhere and I think it is not built yet right. I think the Europeans yeah it is a European concept looking for you know uh, a cheaper way of finding things I think instead of having several telescopes. Um, you know like I said you know we in the Astro business are used to several people trying to sell us stuff. So <laughs> and, you know unless it works you know we are not going to you know any anything any telescope that tries to you know find asteroids is a good thing I think you know I have no doubt about it. But the you know there is always you know in the end there is science and there is marketing right. So you know when you try to you know sell a concept you know we try and market things you know but then the reality of it is you know is 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 slightly you know different you know. So I am not sure. <laughs> question. Not to rain on the parade but is there a possibility that because of Osiris Rex uh -huh. is on the horizon they may say well let us wait until Osiris Rex is complete so we actually know more than we already know now. Sure yeah that is a very good question. So uh, for people who do not know Osiris Rex is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a medium class mission it is about 800 million. Uh, that uh, the University of Arizona won the, that competition a and then we have launched it and it is going to an asteroid called Bennu and it is going to bring back a sample. So Cyrus Rex is what we call doing more characterization we talk about it is going to tell what an asteroid especially the dark ones are made of. Uh, it is not going to discover new asteroids okay. So what NeoCamp does is the discovery part it is going to find targets that could potentially be studied by future Cyrus Rex type missions you know. So slightly different focus on either one it is possible they might say like we do not want to you know look at asteroids anymore uh, there is four other options for them to pick um, you know. But it is a competition and you have to just simply do your best you know whether you win or not you know you have little control over it so. Any other questions? Okay. I think people are waiting for the raffle.